Hello, and welcome to the Biophilic Cities webinar series. I'm Amanda Beck, a graduate student in urban and environmental planning, and I work on the Biophilic Cities project. Through this series, we will hear from practitioners and researchers who are working to bring abundant nature back into cities, to foster deeper connections with the natural world, and to make cities more natureful and richly biodiverse places. The Biophilic Cities Project started at UVA in 2011 to explore and advance nature in cities, and in the fall of 2013, the Global Biophilic Cities Network was launched, which we will hear more about shortly. <coughs> the webinar series, which begins with today's presentation, is one of many ways in which the new Global Biophilic Cities Network will help to disseminate knowledge about the innovative work of cities, organizations, and individuals around the world. This series will consist of eight presentations once a week until mid-November. To see the full schedule of topics and to register for one or more of the upcoming webinar presentations, please visit our website at www.biophiliccities.org slash webinar dash series. <coughs> Next week, we will be hearing from Matt Berlin, the Environmental Program Coordinator for Portland, Oregon. Berlin will share the Tabor to the River program and how innovative stormwater management solutions in the Portland watershed have improved community livability, water quality, and more. Today, we will be hearing from Tim Beatley, director of the Biophilic Cities Project. Beatley is the Teresa Hines Professor of Sustainable Communities in the Department of Urban and Environmental Planning in the School of Architecture at the University of Virginia, where he has taught for the last 28 years. Professor Beatley will describe the history of biophilia and ways that cities can incorporate nature into their design and planning processes. He will also speak about the Biophilic Cities Network, touching on several project partner cities and how to extend and expand the important role nature can play in future development. Tim will talk for roughly 30 minutes to be followed by questions from the audience. And now I will turn it over to Tim. Okay, thank you, uh, Amanda. It's so great that uh, to uh, be with you all, and um, good good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, let's see. I need to try to advance the slides and keep keep going. Uh, let's see. How do I? Let's see, Amanda. How do I get to the next slide? Uh oh connection is cut off. We're having some technical difficulties today, so sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to start. We're going to try to do about 30 minutes, and the goal for this presentation is to uh, talk about the idea of biophi biophilia and biophilic cities. Uh, what are they? Uh, what do they look like? Um, how might we uh, take steps to, to make cities more natureful? Um, that, those are the, the topics for uh, today. So I'm not sure whether you're seeing the slides. I'm advancing some slides. And if all fails, we are recording this uh, here in Charlottesville, and we'll put it up on the web uh, very shortly. But hopefully, you'll be able to see uh, the slides. But this is a slide of uh, making the point that we are in the age of cities. And as most of you know, we've passed that 50% mark of 50% of the world's population living in cities. Uh, we are not going to to turn that trend around, and most of us uh, who are urbanists and urban planners uh, are interested in celebrating cities. We recognize the great benefits and opportunities that cities uh, offer. Uh, so the question then becomes, how do we accommodate that, that urban, uh, th those urban trends, but also provide access, contact, contact with the natural world? And that's the uh, the, the basic idea here. And here's an image uh, showing the the a mix of buildings and built form and trees and, and nature. Uh, the question for us is really how do we, how do we connect urbanites, uh, how do we foster connections, how do we create the conditions uh, in which nature becomes a key aspect of, of urban living. So I'm continuing on with the slides. I'm suspecting that given our technical difficulties on this end, you're probably not seeing the slides, but at some point hopefully you, you will. Um, this next slide is a, a definition, essentially, of biophilia, which is that concept that we're building on. It's to give a lot of credit to E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson at Harvard, um, who 
really coined the term in the way that we think of it today. And here is one of his definitions, biophilia, the innately emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms. Innate means hereditary and hence part of ultimate human nature. So this argument that we have co-evolved with nature and that we've only for a tiny bit of our evolutionary history have been in inside buildings and, and living in cities. So it's no wonder that we are happiest and healthiest and, and most productive when we're in close proximity to, to nature. So the basic premise of the Biophilic Cities Project is that we need to have nature around us. We need to design and plan for that nature. It has to be integrated into the places we live. It can't just be something that we try to, to access during a summer month or on a holiday, a vacation. It has to be integrated into our daily lives and it actually has to be close to where we live. It has to be in our neighborhoods. So that's the basic premise of the Biophilic Cities Project. Um, here is an image of Ed Wilson, E.O. Wilson, and uh, his quote, the human species has grown up in nature. And that's very, very uh, true. So, so a lot of our challenge then becomes how um, do we incorporate that nature in, into cities? So we're going to try to catch up with the slides here and, and we appear to have a connection again, and so we're going to try to speed up. And these are some of the slides that we, we that I talked about, but you haven't seen. So I think that's we're kind of up to speed here. Um, can we advance that one? Yeah. So I want to say just a little bit about the Biophilic Cities uh, project here at, at the University of Virginia. We started things in about 2011, 2012. We had uh, a couple of years of funding from the Summit Foundation based in Washington, also some funding from the George Mitchell Foundation and, and of course, uh, support from the UVA School of Architecture here. Uh, during the first two or three years of our project, we've been focusing l largely on trying to understand what biophilia means in an urban setting. Here's a, a screenshot of our Biophilic Cities webpage. We would encourage everybody to go and, and visit biophiliccities.org, and, and we have a blog and an e-newsletter and uh, a lot of material and inf information on, the, on that page, um, including a, a page uh, for each of our partner cities. So a lot of the work that we uh, have been doing in the first couple of years has been in conjunction with some great partners uh, in cities around the country and around the world. I'll tell you more about, what, about those, some of those partner cities. Um, I want to say also that we have we had a major conference here in Charlottesville in October uh, of 2013, and we brought uh, um, representatives, our partners from these partner cities, and we had a four-day conference that was quite uh, stimulating, uh, kind of full of uh, events and, and, and tours of, of local green projects and, and lots of neat things. On the very last day, we had just a meeting of the partner cities. And you'll see a couple of images here. At the very end of that, uh, we, we printed a very large Biophilic Cities pledge. And we posted it outside. And we, we went through the symbolic gesture of going out and, and signing that, that pledge. And a, a version of that pledge is now actually on the Biophilic Cities webpage, available for anyone, any individual group or city who would like to sign it. But we are. Uh, we have launched um, um, a global network, a global network of biophilic cities, the Biophilic Cities Network. And uh, we imagine that moving forward, it will still be possible for individuals and organizations to, to sign the pledge online and, and be part of the network. Um, but we're developing a, a protocol at the moment for the next round of, of partner cities. And so we'll be asking cities to do a little bit more um, including a, an official um, adopting uh, of a sit by a city council or a, a board of governance of a proclamation, a statement of intention to become a biophilic city and uh, to develop a vision and goals and, and to uh, identify some metrics by which um, that city will uh, track its progress. And, and so uh, that will be released fairly shortly, and, and that will uh, represent kind of the next stage of of our partner cities program. So stay tuned uh, for more information about that. But it's quite exciting. And uh, almost every day, I'm getting emails from people in cities all around the world uh, interested in being part of our network. And uh, if I forget to say this, um, please do send us an email. Send me an email if, if, it, if you'd like to, to be involved either individually in terms of your organization or if you have a city your city would like to be part of the network, and we can help help uh, do that. So 
Um, let me continue, and uh, I'm going to keep keep going. And uh, actually, as a um, another uh, bit of information, it's been it's been interesting to see how our our partner cities uh, have um, gained traction for this idea. And here's an image um, images from Bir Birmingham in the UK, and including Nick Grayson, who's been our our key partner. In the lower, the lower image, and the Lord Mayor in the upper image, the Lord Mayor of Birmingham, and and there were a, a very important set of events actually uh, last April, uh, in which the city of Birmingham announced its intentions to be the first biophilic city in the UK. That was really uh, very exciting, and um, and you see the on the left is a uh, shot of the. Uh, story, uh, news story that we got, uh, new great coverage in The Guardian, fantastic news story uh, there. So um, Birmingham is one of our 10 uh, par partner cities. So okay, I'm going to continue with the slides and go rather quickly here. Um, so to back up, why do we need biophilic cities? And here um, I would say several things, and, and maybe fairly, um, fairly obvious is that we know nature is very important to us and very important to living a, a healthy life. Nature is essential, as this first bullet point, first uh, line suggests, important to mental health and in addressing, uh, reducing long-term chronic stress, which is a, a, a problem of contemporary living. Um, nature creates the conditions, we believe, for, for making friendships and for social socialization, social contact, and that in turn makes us uh, healthier. There's a lot of uh, evidence, and really in the last five years, that the evidence has been mounting about the impact, the power of nature, the power to, to help us to be more creative, to be more generous, uh, to think longer term. And, and I believe that nature in our lives is essential in the sense of, of providing an opportunity for wonder, fun, wonder and awe and amazement. And those things are on curiosity. Those things are often overlooked when we talk about planning and design for cities, but they're really quite uh, important. And then the last point I would make uh, is that biophilic cities are resilient cities. As we look forward and we realize that, that cities around the world are facing some daunting challenges and, and, and responding and adapting to, to climate change, for example, and many of the things that we would do to foster connections with nature and cities, to, to, to grow our, our green infrastructure, to, in, to integrate nature uh, into the built environment. Those things will help us to, to be more resilient, help those cities to address things like uh, rising uh, temperatures during summer months and, and drought and, and uh, adaptation to sea level rise, things, things of that sort. So quite, quite important um, uh, reasons to think about biophilic cities. So a lot of our work um, has been around the question, what is a biophilic city? And uh, it is an open question, and there isn't one answer, I think. There are definitely some important value strands or philosophical strands which are conveyed here, probably too many words on this particular slide. But bio, the bio and the philic uh, together, that it's, it's the nature, but it's the, the affiliation, the connection, the emotional bonds that we have to nature. So uh, these are cities that place nature at the heart of their design and planning, uh, cities that care about and actively protect, restore, and celebrate that nature, that nature, biodiversity, and wildness in and around them. Biophilic cities uh, recognize the profound power, again, uh, that nature has to make us healthier, happier, and to help us lead more meaningful lives. And cities that seek, uh, through many means, to foster deep connections to the natural world. So that's, this is a really short, uh, shorthand uh, description of what a biophilic city is, um, or, or could be. I might also say that um, we're, we're especially interested in places creating the conditions in which we do have nature all, all around us. And we might say that there's an aspiration anyway that a biophilic city is a place that immerses us in nature and surrounds us with that nature. So we hear uh, a, a number of cities reframing their future vision in kind of in this way. And I'll mention the first one, the first example is Singapore, one of our partner cities. And they have changed their official motto actually from Singapore a garden city to Singapore a city in a garden. And that sounds like a, a, a small change, but it's quite profound. The idea that maybe we, ha we have cities with parks but in gardens, uh, um, but, and that's great, and we want to make sure that they're available 
to visit and nearby, and, and many of us, many cities are still understanding the, the, uh, the measure of a good, a good place by its uh, distance to parks. But wouldn't it be even more profound to actually live in a place where you're, you're actually living in the park, living in the garden, living in the forest? So um, that's a bolder aspiration, perhaps. But uh, from a normative and philosophical point of view, that's really what we're imagining a biophilic city to, to be. And another slide that, um, that builds on this, and uh, two, two examples from, from um, two, two cities that we've been involved in. Um, how, do, you know, how do we know that we're moving in the right direction and how do we know we're moving towards this, this vision of, of a city where nature is all around us? And on the left, um, some images from, from St. Louis and Mayor Slay, who's the mayor of St. Louis, and Catherine Warner, who is the sustainability director, holding up a sign um, that has to do with their, their Milkweeds for Monarchs uh, uh, project. And in St. Louis, they're judging the success of, of their efforts by uh, the, the ability to see butterflies and, and to imagine the city as a habitat for butterflies. And in fact, Mayor Slay has declared the goal of, of creating uh, 250 butterfly gardens uh, by a certain time. That's an interesting way, it's an interesting kind of way of judging the progress of a, of a city. On the right, uh, some images uh, from Wellington, New Zealand. Wellington, the capital of New Zealand. I've got some more images later about Wellington. They have also been uh, a partner city, and there's a project there, a fantastic effort, uh, a, a, a bit of wild land in the middle of the city called Zealandia, where they've erected a predator-proof fence, and they're trying to bring back uh, the native species of, of birds. And you'll see the tagline there, Zealandia, bringing birdsong back to Wellington. Birdsong. So this idea, actually, that the neighborhoods around Zealandia, uh, and in fact the entire city, um, might return to a, a place where people could hear bird song from, from native bird species. And the ability for every neighborhood to have, have the, those beautiful sounds. That's a, an interesting way of judging the progress of a city. And that's really close to this vision of an, of an all-encompassing kind of nature in, in, an, in the urban environment. So, um, so that, those are some of the ways that we might imagine what uh, a biophilic city uh, is. I'm going to try to move this forward. We can also think about the, the actual physical conditions and the, the design and planning principles that might apply. And hopefully you see an image here from Helsinki uh, of their green network. Uh, we, can, we could describe a biophilic city as one that has an integrated network of green spaces and this idea that you uh, have the ability to, ha to walk out your front door uh, and have nature around you and then to be able to move to progressively larger amounts of nature. Um, and, and that's true in Helsinki. So in that city, you can move from the dense uh, urban core all the way out to uh, old growth forests at the edge of the city. It's, it's multi-layered, multi-scaled, so we're interested in nature, uh, design nature in, uh, in, the, in buildings with green walls and green rooftops and, and things like that. Uh, all the way to larger networks of, of uh, forests and farmlands and wetlands and ecological systems of all kinds. Um, so that's another way of, of uh, thinking about what a biophilic city um, is. But it, uh, it's important to recognize that uh, a biophilic city is not just a city that has nature. It's not just the presence of nature, presence or absence of nature, but it's the ways we relate to that nature. It's the, the philia part as much as, as the bio. So it's a number of things. It's how engaged uh, is that urban population? How uh, actively uh, are they in enjoying and, and, and visiting and, and actively understanding the nature in that city? How much time is, is spent outside? Are uh, residents, citizens, members of bird watching clubs or native plants uh, organization? Are they, very, are they actively involved in, in caring for that? Uh, that nature all around them, and the, do they recognize common species of flora and fauna, things like that? And I, you see the the one image here, um, the butterflies, um, the, the imagining a culture of curiosity. That's a, going to be a hard thing, uh, probably, to measure, um, but that's a, a pretty important element. So we can have a very green and natureful city, but if uh, the residents, the citizenry, are not engaged, not involved in that nature, then it's not really biophilic. So. This is really an important part of, of uh, things as well. So here is an image. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of this, but uh, one of the things we've been doing with the Biophilic Cities Project and the, and the network 
is to explore the different ways, the different metrics, the different uh, indicators one might, might employ in understanding uh, a biophilic city. And here are kind of four main categories. Um, the first one really more the kind of conventional is nature there, how much nature is there, what kinds of nature, um, the ability to access that nature, percentage of land area covered by trees, for instance. Uh, but again, we're also interested in this, these other categories, biophilic behaviors, patterns, practices, lifestyles, uh, biophilic attitudes and knowledge. What percentage of the, the population can recognize common species of flora and fauna, for instance? And also biophilic institutions and governance. How, what amount of resources does the local government, the city, um, expend uh, in, in caring for uh, and stewarding over the nature in, in that city and, and other ways of judging governance and, and institutions. And we're trying to flesh these out and trying to apply them in, uh, in practice uh, as well. So um, another way to think of this is to think about what it is we, we need to be healthy in a city, what kinds of nature and, and, and what quantities. We've uh, found it very useful to use this idea of the nature pyramid. I have to give a lot of credit to my colleague, Tanya Dankwa Cobb, who came up with this idea. And we've kind of uh, fleshed it out in, in, a, in, in an interesting way, we think. Um, it's based on the, the food pyramid that we uh, have used a lot in this country as a way of thinking about um, the, the different foods that you eat and what would make up a, um, a, a healthy diet, a food diet. So with that food pyramid, the things at the top are foods that you would eat in small quantities. Um, you wouldn't want to build your diet uh, on, on those things. You want to build your foundation of your diet on, on healthier uh, fruits and vegetables and things of that sort. Similarly, there, we can think of an urban nature diet. So at the top of this nature pyramid might be really immersive uh, experiences. When you go off on that summer vacation, that holiday, um, and visit a national park or, or a park in another country, um, that may be a very, a very um, important experience, but we can't build your nature diet around that. We can't afford the carbon footprint associated with, with that. So we've got to think about what's at that, that foundation. And uh, there are things shown here. And there are things like seeing birds and butterflies and green elements uh, in the neighborhood trees. And it becomes an open question, actually. And it's an interesting thing to think about. Do, is there such a thing as a minimum daily requirement of nature? Well, we don't know exactly what that is, but we do believe that, that there is something, that there is a minimum requirement that we need. And, and perhaps it varies by place and by person. We're not uh, sure, but we're exploring that, that uh, idea. It's an intriguing idea to, to, um, to think about. So this idea of the nature pyramid has, in fact, resonated uh, with um, our partner cities. And here's an image actually uh, prepared by our, our friends in Singapore, um, actually taking that, that idea and, and inserting using images and, and species relevant to, to Singapore. So this is Singapore nat nat nature pyramid. It's an interesting question to think about whether like food, whether they're, you know, I get the question all the time, is, there's, is, is this kind of like the Mediterranean diet, that there are different diets in different parts of the world and, and um, different, it's true. Uh, what works and what will make sense in, in the desert environments of Phoenix uh, will be different than what works in, in, in um, a northern latitude some other place, some, a, a kind of wintry environment. Uh, so, so it's a useful exercise to go through this preparing of a, of a city's nature pyramid. But the basic question is, what will make up the nature around us, um, and, and in what amounts, and what, what uh, forms, and what will it take? And it's an interesting question, even thinking about what, what constitutes a dosage or a serving of nature is an interesting idea. Um, if you are walking along and there's a bird that flies in front of you, is that a serving of nature? How many servings of nature will make up the, the requisite requirement for the hour or for the day? Is it one bird, uh, two, one bird and three birds singing? Is it one bird um, um, and, and four trees, a green roof, a green roof, a green wall, a, a, an urban forest? I'm, 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 get, I'm becoming a little bit silly about it, but it's it's a very interesting question for us to think about. And the more uh, uh, nature we're able to layer onto that urban environment, of course, the, the better uh, for, for all of us. 
Um, this is an image actually intended to, uh, sh to make the point that, that biophilia is multisensory. So it's not just the things that you see, of course, though um, that visual connection with nature in the city and the view sheds in cities are very important. But it's also, for example, sound. And uh, we have a lot of examples of cities that are developing some form of sound map. And we have worked on one here in Charlottesville. I like very much uh, this quote, Val Plumwood, uh, um, an ethicist from Australia, he's since uh, passed away, but, uh, but very important work, uh, arguing that we need to kind of rethink sounds and be begin to understand them as voices. So when we hear birds, uh, not just a sound, it's a voice of another living thing that we co-inhabit that city um, with. So, so uh, biophilia and biophilic urbanism, biophilic cities, very much about multi-sensory uh, experiences, um, to be sure. So the rest of the time that I have, and I'm going to go very quickly, we're almost out of time, I think, is to just give you a little bit of a uh, sampling of uh, what some of the partner cities are doing. And I'm not going to do any of them justice, but it, it's uh, important to recognize it that a number of the presentations later in the subsequent um, webinars in this series this fall will elaborate on, number, on a number of these, these uh, cities. So um, Vitoria Gastez, the capital of the Basque country in Spain, has been one of our partner cities. Um, Rebecca Dios is probably listening today, we hope, who's been, who's been a, a major partner on this, as well as her colleague, Luis Andres uh, Arrive. Um, fantastic story of their green ring that circles this beautiful city and the latest chapter being uh, an, this notion of an interior green ring bringing that nature into the dense city and um, focusing on one corridor in particular where they're daylighting a stream and, and bringing it right through um, the, the city. So that's one partner city. O Oslo is a, another city we've been uh, studying over several years. Three quarters of, of the city is in protected forest um, and uh, some pretty amazing goals being set, including the, the daylighting and restoration of the eight major rivers that connect the forest and the, and, and the fjord. And um, one of the most uh, impressive and, and most developed networks of, of uh, trails in, in the city. And uh, whoops, I'm um, failing to advance here. So at San Francisco, another uh, example of, of one of our partner cities. And uh, here is uh, Jane Martin, who's a landscape architect, who will be actually giving one of the webinars later uh, in the series. And uh, one of the things that San Francisco has been doing um, is to experiment, to, to explore ways that nature can uh, be inserted in a pretty dense city and ways to take back, um, in some cases temporarily, but often permanently, spaces that have been given over to cars. So they have been pioneering this idea of parklets, little parks created out of two or three parking spaces, on-street parking spaces. And Jane uh, has designed this, um, this space, which is the first residential parklet in the city of, of San Francisco. And it includes uh, even a vegetative dinosaur, which you see here, which she's affectionately uh, named Trixie. So San Francisco, pretty impressive as well. I mentioned Singapore. Singapore has been doing many things, uh, in particular, uh, the idea of uh, integrating um, nature into the vertical realm. Here are some images that uh, show their, a portion of their park connector system. And some of it is elevated, as this, this, um, this trail, this, these images suggest, um, the trail kind of going through the canopy of the forest. Uh, but more than 180 kilometers of these park connectors that bring, that connect dense portions of the city um, to, to larger parks. Um, pretty, pretty interesting, and so they have been able actually to um, increase their, their vegetative cover uh, in this city at the same time that they've accommodated popu population growth. So um, a number of stories, and by the way, we have a, um, a film about Singapore. It's on, on YouTube. If you Google Singapore Biophilic City, you'll find it, about 45 minutes. And we're trying to develop films uh, to tell the stories of all of the partner cities. So this is one segment of that film, which is about uh, a hospital, uh, KTPH, which is probably the most biophilic uh, facility that I've ever encountered. And it's interesting, they are judging their success, actually, uh, in terms of, of healing of patients, but also in terms of the numbers of birds bird and, and butterfly species that they uh, see on, on the facility, on site. 
and they're keeping a running, running tally, in fact, on, on one, uh, one wall. Um, part of uh, the, the top portion of one of the main buildings is uh, taken over by an, ur by an urban farm, uh, which includes uh, 140 uh, fruit trees, uh, pr pretty impressive as well. So Singapore has been innovating in this, in, in finding ways to integrate nature into high-rise high buildings, where most people are living in, in these vertical structures. And the city, in fact, um, has a, a landscape replacement policy that requires that new structures in most parts of the city um, have, to, have to add nature in the vertical realm, at least to the extent um, of the land taken at the, by the site, by the ground level site. And then examples, uh, new, newer projects like this one, Park Royal, they're actually m more than doubling that. So they're, they're losing nature at the ground level, but replacing it in the form of really creative green elements uh, in the vertical uh, uh, realm. Okay, and very quickly, I'm almost done. I want to just say a little bit uh, about Wellington, New Zealand. And here uh, is an image actually from Wellington. And a great story uh, about this city um, transitioning from uh, thinking just about its terrestrial environment. It has a long history of, of, uh, of green belts, a town belt that, go, that, that circles the center of the city going back to 1840, and a, uh, a larger green belt connected to the, the town belt, and, and lots of terrestrial land conservation and tree planting, a lot of very, very impressive things. But to me, one of the most impressive things is they understand that their um, vision of nature has to include the, the marine environment. They're on a peninsula, and they're, they're surrounded by uh, water. And so this idea of a blue belt is something that they are um, developing and, and exploring. And here are some images, actually, that there is a marine prote protected area uh, in the city close, close not, ver not a, a far distance away from the center. And there is a marine um, education center, and these kids actually are, are experiencing, are uh, having fun in the touch tank in that, um, in that facility. So I'm very nearly done. Um, let's see if I can, I think that may be, in fact, the last slide. And so, and now I think we have time for a, a handful of questions. So the, the idea behind these webinars is to, to do something pretty quick. So the aim is about 30 minutes. And, um, and uh, hopefully, we'll, we'll have lots more information and, and resources for you on biophysicscities.org. So if there are things that you see and, and places you want to learn more about, um, we'll, we'll be providing some, some ways to further explore things. So we thank you very much. Um, but let's see what kind of uh, questions we have. And I'm going to try to read them here from another machine. So here's one. My question is, how can we promote the idea of biophilic cities in places where the natural environment is viewed as a luxury rather than a necessity? And how can we go about engaging people living in those areas? So I think I've made the point that, um, that nature is not a luxury. I mean, I think that's one thing we need to, to say from the beginning, that uh, so much of the evidence suggests that, that for instance, if you are uh, operating a company and or you're thinking about uh, the sort of interior spaces for workers, you might think that those green plants um, represent a luxury, but in a recent study actually coming out of Australia that shows that with plants, uh, worker productivity goes up something like 15 percent, pretty, pretty significant increase. And similar things, similar kinds of arguments uh, about the economic and other value associated with investing in nature, whether it's trees in the city to, to, to cool, uh, provide shade, evapotranspiration, all those. The, uh, almost in every case, the return is, is much greater, in fact, than the investment. So that's one answer. That's probably the first thing that I would say, and, and that contact with the natural world is not something optional. It's something we absolutely uh, need. And uh, so we have to work hard with that argument. Let's see what other questions. Um, here is a, a question. So uh, at at this point, I think it's important that we get nature into our communities as soon as, as possible, regardless of the type, particularly in cities where you'll need resilient species. But at what point should the, should the conversation consider native organisms and their ability to generate benefits to local ecosystem health? Should we discuss the risks associated with invasive and non-native nature? Absolutely. And so um, my view is that we, we should definitely uh, 
a, attempt to, to restore and insert with native species where, where we can. Um, that said, it, it may be that uh, as we move forward, we're going to imagine in cities hybrid landscapes and new kinds of nature that, that may, uh, in, may integrate non-native species, but uh, ideally, of course, non-natives that are not so invasive and, and so, so destructive. So, so um, I generally would argue that nature in every way possible uh, is good, but we do have to, to, to try to do what we can to, to um, protect, restore native landscapes and native species first if we can. And by the way, we haven't talked about this, but uh, what nature is is a really open question for us, of course. And uh, we know, for instance, that, that we, many of us enjoy seeing uh, n forms of you know, natural shapes and forms in the design of buildings and built environments, not actual nature, but uh, that's, a, that's a kind of biophilia as well in, in, in cities, and we have, to be, um, we have to think about the value of that as well. Okay, how about uh, one or two more questions before we stop? Um, here's a question. Nat natural infrastructure is one of the most important lines of defense against extreme weather and rising sea levels. Have you thought about spreading the word of biophilic cities by using the climate change angle? That's absolutely uh, right. And uh, it, I believe that we, we need that. We have that intrinsic need to, to connect with nature. We need it in our lives. We need it for emotional uh, reasons. Um, we have ethical obligations to, 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 to uh, steward over it. Uh, but absolutely, when you look forward, we look down the road uh, and see all of the challenges, all the climate change um, impacts that are that are likely um, a, a, m incorporating nature to, to address those is is a really a really powerful uh, strategy and it actually was one of the bullets on on that slide it's the last bullet I think on the slide that uh, asked the question why biophilic cities earlier in the presentation um, biophilic cities are resilient cities almost by definition uh, and so we can um, perhaps expand our, the, the, the political power, if you will, uh, behind biophilic cities in that way, and I think it's a really good uh, point to make. Two more questions um, that we can handle. So here's one. Can we have some discussion on the question of cost? This always seems to be the killer on biophilic initiatives. How are partner cities addressing this? Well, I think we'll hear more about this over the course of the webinar series, and, and hopefully you'll tune in and, and you'll see some of the creative funding strategies. Uh, it is a question, and uh, uh, again, these are, I would say, very, very good investments, and you get a, a pretty amazing return on those investments, but there, there will often be some upfront costs, whether we're talking about installing green rooftops or, or planting uh, trees, and perhaps we, we do need some creative uh, strategies for, for doing this. And, and a number of cities have developed them, and, and so, for example, in San Francisco, there's a, a carbon uh, a fund, and so whenever there is travel um, uh, undertaken by uh, department staff um, at the city, they, a certain percentage of that goes into a fund, which is then used to, to, uh, to fund the planting of trees. Um, I think we probably need to be a lot more uh, creative about capturing uh, the economic values that those investments in nature deliver. So we know, for example, that um, projects like the High Line in New York have had a huge impact in terms of uh, enhancing, expanding um, property uh, values uh, around them. We know that that's generally true with, with uh, investments of nat uh, in nature. Are there ways to capture uh, those economic values and uh, use them to, to, uh, to, to make some of these investments that we have to make? So it's a terrific uh, um, um, question, and I'll hope that some of the partner cities, as, as we hear more uh, presentations over the course of the fall, uh, will give you more, more insights about that. Okay, one, one last question. Um, my question, how biophilic city, uh, how biophilic city change change the city's urban policy. I'm not quite sure how, yeah, how can they um, change urban policy? Well, I think I'll circle back around, and maybe this is a good place to stop, go back to the vision of the kind of place that we want to live in, the kind of city that we imagine. And we've got huge, again, huge 
daunting challenges in thinking about uh, heat and drought and water scarcity and all, all those things that we're looking at down the road. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to live, we want places that are very livable, have a high quality of life, that are healthy. And those places have to incorporate nature. Nature is not just an afterthought. It's the key design uh, principle, key design idea. And so everything has to follow from that. So if we have a vision of a, sustain, of a biophilic city, um, this idea of living in a garden, living in a park, having that nature all around us, uh, then, then we hope that, that the, all of the other policies in that city will, will follow from it. So um, we, we see you know, the, the, the development codes, hopefully, will, will change, um, as we're seeing in many cities already, in places like Toronto, where green rooftops are, are being mandated now, being required. Um, I think, though, that the vision, being, putting forward the, the, the notion, the vision of, of a city, a natureful city, is really the key starting point. And, and the, the, the policy levers are many. Um, and they, with that strong vision, they, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done, and we still need a lot of insights and guidance about what works and doesn't, and what uh, policy levers and planning strategies are most appropriate. But I think a lot of that becomes uh, just a lot easier if if we all embrace the kind of vision of of a, of a natureful city. So that was a partial answer, um, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to explore these, these terrific questions in even more detail as we move forward. So we're going to end. We want to thank you uh, very much for joining us. And um, the schedule, again, as Amanda mentioned, the schedule is online by, on biophilicities.org. And, uh, and the next um, webinar actually is, is Matt Berlin's uh, webinar. It'll be our presenter uh, next Wednesday at 12.30. And he will be talking about uh, initiatives, efforts in Portland, Oregon. And we're hopeful that we won't have any technical difficulties on, on that day. But we thank you very much. And um, we, again, please send me a, an email if there's any possibility that your city might want to join the network. Um, but thank you very much. And, and uh, we hope to, to, to see you at uh, future webinars. Thanks. And we'll sign off. <laughs>